And our last presentation will be from Tarek Galal, who is a researcher at Hasno Platner Institute, um, who will talk to us about a scheme for privacy preserving certificate validation by third parties. Um, when you're ready, thanks. Thank you everyone for staying for my presentation. I'm going to talk to you about our work on the privacy preserving outsource certificate validation. So digital certificates, they are very useful in uh, verifying uh, possession of certain user attributes. Uh, one very interesting uh, example of digital certificates were the so-called COVID certificates. These were the first widely deployed instance of user certificates, meaning certificates that are issued to and used by end users rather than servers. There has been about two billion issuances of COVID certificates. And they contain two kinds of information. They have user identifying information denoted UID in this picture and some attributes describing the kind of vaccination or recovery situation of the certificate holder. They were typically verified in an offline manner. So one would present the certificate, show it to a verifier who scans it with the camera to determine its validity. Interesting challenges arise when taking this process to an online setting. Take for example a user who wants to engage in an online ticket booking process with some airline. The user possesses some user identifying information, UID and some attributes that have been certified by one of many issuers that may exist. The user begins the uh, booking process by requesting a ticket from the airline. But the airline requires all its passengers to prove that at the departure time, they would be eligible for taking the flight in accordance to policies determined by their destination country. How this verification took place was by, uh, for example, when the verification of COVID certificates was a travel requirement, was by the user transferring her certificate directly to the airline, which would then carry out the necessary validation steps. But this poses certain challenges and complexities of their, over the airline. Namely, it needs to be aware of all the possible policies that could come from all potential uh, countries its passengers are traveling to, and only then it could determine the acceptability of the user's attributes and whether the, uh, this, the correct policy actually accepts the uh, issuer of their certificate. So rather than having the airline play the role of the verifier in this protocol, an idea is to outsource this task to a dedicated validator service. And in this case, the airline would be relying on this validator to carry out the necessary check of making sure that the user has a correct certificate with policy passing attributes and informing it for, with the result so that accordingly it would issue the flight tickets. So this approach of outsourcing the validation of user certificates to a uh, validated service has already been proposed by the EU Commission in form of a technical specification for handling digital COVID certificates in online booking scenarios. It has already been implemented by Telecom in Germany, but also the World Health Organization announced interest in adapting this system beyond COVID. And this is what inspired our work. We believe that the verification of user certificates uh, the, or the complexity of it is not specific to digital COVID certificates, but to any user-centric certificates that may contain attributes with no standard format coming from a multitude of issuers and that are expected to satisfy a flexible set of, pos of policies. We also believe that this approach of outsourcing the validation of these certificates is a promising solution to this problem which is why in our work, we analyze the EU specification to understand how it works and what it wants to achieve in terms of security and privacy. We also propose a new system for a privacy preserving outsource certificate validation. So our starting point was by looking at the EU specification to understand how it works and what it wants to achieve. There you have a user who possesses some UID and some attributes that have been certified by one of the many issuers. But the 
specifications focus is not exactly about the issuance process, but rather on how to outsource this validation task. And as you can see, there's a lot of things going on here, all with the main goal of having the validator service ensure that the user has a correct certificate for policy passing attributes on behalf of the relying party. But luckily in this talk, we do not have to dissect every single thing that is going on here because instead I will summarize to you the goods and the bads that we found in this protocol. The first good thing is that the relying party does not handle the user certificates itself. It also does not learn anything about the user's attributes uh, except for whether they satisfy a certain policy or not. So the specification indeed fulfills this goal of outsourcing this task entirely to the validated service. Another good thing is that if the relying party receives a notification from the validator service with the verification result of a particular user, then it is ensured that this user is indeed the one talking to it. And this is to avoid a situation where a user might claim towards the relying party to possess a particular uh, UID, but presents a certificate belonging to a different UID towards the validator service. So the specification ensures user consistency in a particular verification session. But how this user consistency is satisfied came with a downside. It requires the validator to be fully trusted. And this is due to the fact that the validator learns the user's identity. It learns the UID in this protocol. And if we think about a real world application of this system, it is a rather natural expectation that the number of validators would be rather small and serving a large number of relying parties, which would make the uh, validators a single point of trust for privacy of the users. But the validator also learns the user's attributes, which is not ideal because say the validator does not get to learn the user identifying information, these attributes might still be indirectly revealing some information that eventually give away the identity of the users. But if you compare the case of the validator learning the UID and of it learning the, uh, the attributes, the validator's main task is actually to verify these attributes. So one could argue that it is justified that it learns these attributes with the hopes that it doesn't disclose identifying information. On the other hand, there isn't an inherent requirement for learning the UID in order for the validator to be able to um, uh, carry out its job. Another reason for why the validator needs to be fully trusted is the fact that it receives the user's certificates in its entirety. So a corrupt validator has all information it needs that would enable it to impersonate its user if it wants to. We're also not sure whether such a protocol needed to be that complicated. For instance, some of the keys and some of the algorithms seem not to contribute to any security or any privacy and rather played no role. So now that we have seen how the EU specification for outsourcing validation looks like, our next steps were to make use of the lessons learned from it when we make a new model for the privacy preserving system for outsource certificate validation. And in our model, we aim at avoiding the downsides and the uncertainties we have seen here by giving formal definitions for better security and better privacy. And of particular interest uh, in our model is the challenge of how, to, how do we have the validator not learn anything about the user's identity, but still somehow capture the notion of UID binding uh, user binding in a verification session. So this is how our model for the privacy preserving outsource validation looks like. It enables the validator to answer the question of attribute acceptability with better security and better privacy guarantees. More specifically, the relying party does not handle the user certificates or learn about the attributes. This is all outsourced to the validator service, which ensures the user has a correct certificate with policy passing attributes. But in our model, the validator does not receive the user certificate, but more abstractly, some proof of possession of attributes that is unusable across different sessions. And this way, our model can provide impersonation resistance. 
The validator also does not learn anything about the user's UID. In fact, cannot even tell in different sessions whether it is, it is talking to the same or to a different UID. And thinking about having this level of privacy of the user with respect to the validator came with a big challenge. If the validator does not learn anything about the UID, then how do we capture the notion of UID binding or UID consistency in a validation session? To elaborate, the, um, the relying party wants to learn this UID, but it's restricted from getting a certificate or something that proves possession of this UID. The validator service, on the other hand, learns the attributes, gets a proof of possession of attributes, but is restricted from learning a, um, the UID itself. So in a way, we are splitting the user certificates into two parts, where the relying party gets a, just a claim of possession of UID, while the, very, while, the, while the validator gets a verifiable claim of the possession of the attributes. And to be able to capture this notion of UID consistency in the, in the, uh, in the verification session, we needed to have a way that links this claim to the verifiable claim without giving away this UID to the validator. And we were able to achieve that by making use of a pseudonym that enables the validator to blindly bind the validation result to the UID in the user's full certificate without knowing both of them. Overall, our model has a simple structure and requires only a minimal number of messages to fly around. When looking at the EU specification from a lens of our model, we were able to validate that it, is, it indeed does not provide impersonation resistance or the kind of privacy we want from the user with respect to the validator. But to be fair, this notion of privacy is new. This is something we added in our model. It wasn't part of the scope of the specification when it came out. Our analysis also showed that the EU specification was indeed too complicated and could get away with less number of messages and less number of keys and still satisfy the privacy and security they intended to achieve. In our paper, we give a new construction from standard builder blocks that is provably secure and that provably satisfies all these properties. To summarize, we introduced a new system for privacy preserving outsource certificate validation and we have formally analyzed the EU specification within our model. We've given a new construction from standard building blocks that is provably secure and is efficient for real world usage. Thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Tarek. Um, so one question is related to the EU specification. How is it actually presented? Is it mostly pros and you systematized it? Or, or do they actually specify some of the algorithms you would need to use when you're implementing um, a validation scheme? So exactly, they, they specify the algorithms uh, and the communication flow and everything that needs to go on on the validator service side, on the relying party side, uh, what encryption they need to execute or what signatures they need to verify. So it's a technical specification for carrying out all of that. Okay, great. And another question related um, is if uh, this is a legal requirement or th if this is a suggestion for implementing these systems. Um, like, I I is it uh, uh, legally enforced, like if you were to implement one of these systems? Um, the EU spec. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it is just a proposal. Uh, a proposal. Yeah. Okay. Okay, another question we have um, from Lennart. Do you consider network level privacy as well? We, I mean, we not exactly network level privacy, but I mean, our, in our model, in our security model and privacy, we implicitly assume that the, uh, that the parties have a secure connection between them, uh, secured with TLS. So this is an implicit assumption that, sure. that we have. Okay, great. And we have time for maybe one more question, if there's any more. Otherwise, please join me to thank the speaker one more time. Thank you very much, Tarek.